How many people come up and complain about their children? And when I listen and say, yeah, that's just exactly the same as the last parent said. That's what the last parent said. They're all like that. Don't think you've got a wrong one or you've done something bad and they're not sort of behaving. They're all like that. Even I read this, how hard it is to get your kids up in the morning to go to school. And I read this, this is science, you know, facts. Teenagers are genetically programmed to stay up late at night and get up late in the morning. It's in their genes, they can't do anything about it, poor things. It's not them, That's, they're not the problem, it's the school, they should start much later. During the day, not a sort of, you know, what time does school start here, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock? But anyway, so you start too early, you know, the poor teenagers, you know, just, they're, they're not wired up for, for starting that early. And they're wired for staying up late at night. So poor old teenagers, you feel sorry for them. And, and so what do you expect? But do you expect your kids to do well at school? Your expectations, I mentioned this to the monks last night, just to show how our expectations and how we don't live in a real world. This was a little party trip, which I've done a few years ago here, and I can do it again now. You can do this if ever you're giving a talk, because it makes a few people laugh, but it also makes a very powerful point of how deluded we are. I'm going to ask you to really be honest right now. Be really straightforward. If you think you're above average intelligence, please put up your hand. Wow, how many dummies have we got in this Buddhist society? <laughs> Can I be honest? Okay, I don't need to sort of get you to put up your hand because about, I just say, 80-90% of you think you're above average intelligence, don't you? <laughs> Only 50% of you are above average intelligence. Only 50% of people can be above average intelligence. We always think that we're more intelligent than other people. That's a deceit which we live in in our life. I know you, many of you have been here long enough, I've already told you. If Ajahn Brahm asks you to put up your hand, don't do it. Because <laughs> you always get into trouble afterwards. <laughs> but anyhow, you know those people. So in deceit, we, we expect even more of ourselves than we can give ourselves. So if your kid doesn't do well at school, just be kind to that kid, for goodness sake. And you've heard me say before, you, many of you here are Buddhists, I hope. Of course, you could be spies from the Christians or <laughs> <laughs> undercover agents. <laughs> but most of you expect a Buddhist. And what's the most important teaching? Well, look, any person here who's a Buddhist, whose children come in the top 5% or the bottom 5% at school, you're bad Buddhists. That's not a good Buddhist family. Top 5%, bottom 5%, that's not good. Because in Buddhism, we believe in the middle way. <laughs> and actually, it's much better as a kid being in the middle. There's a lot of stress you know, if you're in the top echelons. And of course, a lot of problems if you're in the bottom. But it doesn't matter if you're in the bottom. Because this, I've mentioned this in, usually in the monastery and in the sort of the retreat. If your kid is the bottom of the class and giving a really bad results, remember this story. This was one of my heroes. This was a kid in Thailand who went to grade one and failed grade one. Imagine that. I don't know how you can fail grade one. You know, whether you couldn't draw properly or you couldn't, I don't know what else, they, what are they doing in grade one? You couldn't make sort of things out of sort of card or whatever. But anyway, he failed. So he had to repeat the year. <laughs> and the teacher gave him extra attention. But even with extra attention, in the, the best one in the world, she couldn't pass him. So all his friends went ahead. And he had to repeat grade one for the third time. And after three years of grade one, it was a waste of time. So the teacher said, I'm sorry, we just you know, can't actually educate you. You have to leave. And imagine that, failing grade one. I see people sometimes you know, have to repeat a year at university. But failing grade one, that really takes something special. <laughs> so what do you do with someone who's so dumb, they can't even pass grade one at school? 
in Thailand, they send him to the monastery to make him a monk. <laughs> Not all monks started out like that. <laughs> so they send him to the monastery. And in the monasteries, you know, the monks are very, very kind. And they got very patient. And so the abbot of this British monastery where they sent this guy was so patient and tried to teach him how to do a little bit of chanting and learn something about you know, the Four Noble Truths. You know, what's the second one again? He kept on saying, he didn't even know the first one. And the chanting, na, 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 what's the next syllable? Namo tassa. It was hopeless. And after three years, this, this monk who was so patient just gave up on him. Just look, you just, I can't deal with you. So it was really, really dumb big time. And what do they do with somebody like that in Thailand? They send him to the forest monasteries. <laughs> That's now my lot. But this fellow, he was just such a simple mind that when they told him, just be in the present moment, be silent and watch your breath, he could do that with no problem at all for as long as he wanted. He got this incredible deep meditation and became a famous meditation teacher. And when he had to do the chanting, this is just an aside, the only way he could actually chant, which sometimes monks have to do, because of his very powerful deep meditation, he could recall a past life when he did learn the chanting. And he'd actually access that past life when he had to do chanting, to actually get the chanting through, so he could actually chant with all the other monks. But in this life he just couldn't learn it. It's an amazing story. So if you've got a child like that, send him to me. <laughs> we could have this great monk or great nun for the future of Buddhism, a great teacher. So the point of the story is it doesn't matter if your child is not so doing well. Love them for who they are. They could be a great monk or nun in the making and you're making them feel bad about themselves. I remember that's this story in the book, Open the Door of Your Heart, as I was a school teacher. And sometimes as a school teacher, you know those school teachers here, you know, you're in this sort of um, situation, you're supposed to do things, and sometimes you know, there's some inside of you say, this is not right, why do I have to keep marking all these kids and, and making their life so difficult with encouraging them to pass exams? And, you know, there's always a dilemma in any sort of job, and the teacher there's a dilemma of you know, what you really think you know, education should be, and what the system says it is. But anyway, you had to play by the rules and so he gave the exams and at the end of the year this gave out the report cards in my class. And there's this poor kid. When I gave him the report card, he read it. Thirtieth. Bottom of the class. In a class of thirty. And I could see, I, I saw his face because I knew, you know, who came bottom. People who came top, they say, yeah, 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 we came top. But this poor kid, you know, his jaw dropped, his shoulders hunched. He looked so sad. He was really suffering. Imagine you have to take that report card back to your parents. How do you do, son? Bottom dad. <laughs> That's suffering for a, you know, a young kid. He must have been about 12 or 13. And so, I, even then I was a very compassionate teacher. I was kind. You can't just ignore a person who's suffering like that. So I went up to him and sort of stood by him and said, you came bottom of the class. Yes, sir. How am I going to show this to my dad? I said, look, you actually deserve a medal for this. Because I taught him a little bit of Buddhism. In Buddhism, we've got something called a Bodhisattva. Now, a Bodhisattva is someone who sacrifices everything for other people. It's out of great compassion. And Bodhisattvas sacrifice sometimes a whole life for the benefit of others. And I think that's what you are. You've taken this terrible position at the bottom of the class, so none of your friends will have to actually to take this position. You've done this so selflessly. All the other conceited, arrogant people, they just want to become top. But you've taken the humble position and taken that suffering on yourself so no one else has to endure what's coming to you from your mum and dad this evening. He said, you're such a kind and wonderful person. In Buddhism, we'd actually praise you for doing things like that. And he looked at me as if I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but it stopped him getting sad and upset and he laughed afterwards. It's not the end of the world, coming bottom of the class. It was a big deal anyway. They keep on saying it's great when you fail an exam. 
because then you don't have to take one next year. That's what happened to me. I kept passing the exams. They were endless. I never stopped. Because if you're passing the exam, there's always another one next week or next year. If you fail one, at least you, you get it out of the way. You failed. And so, great, you don't have to do exams anymore. Much more important things to do in life than exams, aren't there? <laughs> but anyway, it was the attitude to becoming bottom, or the attitude of becoming top. The attitude to the things in life, that was the problem, not the world, but the way people look at it. And you cannot change the world, really. You can alter it a tiny bit, and it's good to try, but come on. Are we going to try and make politicians not argue? Are we going to try to make you know, people not be greedy and, and fraudulent? Are we going to try? We're going to try so there's no criminals on the streets. We can try, and it's worth trying, but we're not going to achieve it, are we? But instead, we can learn how to cope, to make peace, and to not take such things so seriously. To expect life to just to be as life is, and to love her as she is, not as she should be. And the same way you treat your partner, you can treat life. Yeah, it would be wonderful if we never got sick. It would be wonderful if our, if our cars never broke down. It would be wonderful if our flights weren't delayed. It would be wonderful if there was no SARS, and no wars, no cancer. Would it? Sometimes you ask that question. Would it be so wonderful if these things never existed? It's a radical question to ask. But sometimes there's something, I was talking to someone who's uh, severe brain cancer, don't know how long she's going to live. It's a wonderful experience. Now you're the centre of this beautiful, loving uh, community. Your family and friends are now actually coming and saying how much you mean to them. If they'd only said that before. But sometimes we do need the cancer, we do need the tragedy to actually to inspire ourselves, to express our love and our concern, our kindness and compassion, our softness. So maybe there is a reason for such things in this world. Sometimes it is the suffering, the so-called tragedies, the so-called difficulties, which actually inspire something inside of us, something which we're too lazy to, to really generate except in times of difficulty. Perhaps there is a reason for these so-called tragedies. And there is. And you see it. And it brings out the best in humanity. It brings beauty into our world. When life goes along perfectly, without any problem, I really doesn't encourage and incite the most beautiful part of human nature.